What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, make sure you leave a comment. Today we're going to do a little reading out of the book, my book. It's called Blood on the Razor Wire, same as the channel. If you haven't got one already and you want one, you can get one from us at freedomfighterspc at gmail.com, autograph copies. We charge $25 postage and handling, all that stuff's in, in, included in there. So anyway, we're almost at that 25,000 subscribers. When we get there, you guys know what we're doing. We're giving away $2,500, 500 to five different people. You know, hopefully some um, single mothers, some single fathers, people that are struggling. You know, we want to give back. So that's our mission. Today we're going to read chapter 25, 20, and 26, I think. I think we'll do two chapters. Maybe three, but I'm, I'm thinking two, and then we'll discuss it. We'll talk a little bit about it. So let's get started. Chapter 25. I am beginning to feel like a desperate fowl caught in a hunter's trap. I'm starting to dislike the guys in the car. I dislike Steve more each day. I dislike him the most. Seeing through his manipulation game gets easier when I pay attention to his actions, the decisions he makes, the way he talks to people. All these paint a different picture. I was never a follower in the free world. When Adam and Dennis first approached me, I felt I had no choice except to buy into the car's ideology and objectives. Everything they sold me about the car, the brotherhood, is turning into a farce. Time has a way of revealing things. Most of the guys in the car are simply along for the ride. They were fed the same stories I was. Fear made most of us join the car. Big Sandy leaves men in a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of position. Steve has a way of making people feel like they are indebted to him for being so kind as to allow us into the fold. As a result, when Steve makes a request, no matter what it is, people jump to attention to please the master puppeteer. Assaulting people, making weapons, carrying them to the yard, giving him money, transporting contraband. When he beckons, men answer. I decided not to be one of Steve's do boys for too long. Frank feels the same way. That's how he's felt since his first day on the compound. Our pockets are empty, so Frank suggests we find a prison hustle. We juggle ideas back and forth, but ultimately, we decide that moonshining is the only real option we have. Red introduced me to the lucrative business of prison intoxicants. Now Frank wants me to be his partner. Before long, I'm smuggling hundreds of sweet and low packets out of the kitchen. I was agitated when Steve had me doing it for him for free. Now that it benefits me, I have no problem with it. Business kicks off, thus cutting up potatoes, opening hundreds of sweet and low sackets, and mixing everything together in a bag. Frank agrees to hide the first batch in his locker. I'll take the next one. In four days, we turn water into wine, much like Jesus. I suspect the Lord's process was a little different than ours. We put our makeshift lab together. A few hours later, we have homemade vodka. We both take a small sip of our prison potion. Damn, I say, coughing into my hand. Who the hell has the balls to drink this shit? Oh, you'll see who has the balls to drink it in a minute or two, Frank says, rubbing his hands together like an excited child. We put a small amount of our concoction on a spoon, turn out the lights, and put fire to it. A blue flame dances in the spoon. Like a gypsy belly dancer, the dance is reflected in our eyes. That's gas, Chad. We got gas. And with gas, we got cash. Gas is a prison slang for high-quality alcohol. People are always looking for gas. Gas can chase their sorrows away. We fill eight empty peanut butter jars. I do the math in my head. Eight bottles at eight books apiece. We have $320 in jailhouse money. We get $160 apiece. Word spreads that the two white boys have some serious rocket fuel for sale. On a Friday evening, it takes all of 20 minutes to sell out. We timed things so we had our juice ready for the start of the weekend. Even in prison, weekends are party time. Frank and I have our own version of Grey Goose. With our first success, our business relationship is cemented. We head to the local hangout, Red's Room, where he is tattooing Sad Boy, the Serenos gang member I played handball with when I first arrived. He sips his peanut butter jar of prison vodka as the needle drills into his skin. Sad Boy has his sidekick, Droopy, with him, his own jar in hand. Even though we are different races and in different cars, the five of us have become close. If anything happened with the blacks, our car would join forces with the Mexicans. Feeling good off the moonshine, 
Sad Boy starts imitating Steve. It's uncanny. He does it almost perfectly. Chad, Frank, I need both of you to start wearing your boots to chow so you can hide Sweet Lou in, in them for me. Don't forget the gang members have to go. Sad Boy says this in a fake Boston accent, missing as many hours as he can. He knows we disdain Steve. Red pulls the needle from Sad Boy's arm and doubles over laughing. Frank and I are in tears. Troopy joins in. He's playing Dennis. Steve is bald-headed, skinny, no eyebrows or facial hair. When he talks, he sounds like he just sucked a helium-filled balloon down his throat. This guy is my leader. What an idiot I am. This thought in conjunction with Sad Boy's jokes sent me into a hysterical laughter. For the first time in a long time, I am laughing so hard, I begin to cry. Grateful that the small jokes take me out of prison. The gang that Sad Boy belongs to, the Serenios, is the most serious gang in federal prison in my view. They demand respect and have no problem turning to extreme violence at the drop of a hat to achieve their goals. Serenios have each other's back no matter the situation or who the problem is with. It doesn't matter if it's another prisoner, a guard, or even the warden. They will attack like a pack of wild dogs if ordered to do so by their shot caller. The shot caller is usually a black hand. Black hands are the men who run the Mexican Mafia, who in turn run the Serenios. The Serenios have a lot of rules. One of their rules is that they are not allowed to do business with blacks. Sad Boy was accused of drinking with a black prisoner while at an FCI in Texas. He says the accusations were false, but it resulted in him being beat off the yard. The concomitant security level increase landed him at Big Sandy. Droopy had his own problems at another FCI. He has a penchant for heroin, so if I had to guess, his transfer to the Bluegrass State likely stems from his opium addiction. Droopy, Droopy is a fearless felon. Two or three times a week, he sneaks into the lieutenant's office where staff members keep their personal items. The office door is never locked, almost inviting Droopy to stop by. He usually leaves with a pack of cigarettes or a can of chewing tobacco to pay for his growing heroin habit. Droopy's petty larceny does not persuade staff to stop leaving their things laying around. If they continue to leave their things laying around, they will continue to find their way into the hands of this wonderful magician. Today, he is eating a crab salad with his alcohol. Knowing crab salad is not on the commissary, I ask, where'd you get that? Oh, check it out, Holmes. I got hungry, so I stopped by the lieutenant's office and grabbed it out the fridge. I seen it there. Thought they left it for me. He sticks his tongue out as he laughs. Again, I find myself crying from the laughter along with everyone else. Man, I ain't never going to get this tattoo done with you crazy motherfuckers in here, Red says when he, catch, when he can catch a breath. They say there is a fool born every day, and every time Droopy strikes the lieutenant's office, the saying is manifested. The fire alarm startles us, breaking up our laughter. No one seems to know what is going on. This is the first time any of us ever heard a fire alarm go off in prison. Droopy leaves the room to investigate. When he returns, Sad Boy asks, what the fuck are they doing? Are we in elementary school doing fire drills now? Nah, Holmes. They said that dumbass white crip kid hit the fire alarm on accident, Droopy replies. Who, Spivey, I ask? Yeah, that's him. Everyone outside, let's go, men. Fire in the building, everyone out. Staff are in the unit ushering us outside. Panic strikes the dorm. Men scramble to hide knives and other contraband. More staff are swarming the unit, unit ushering all of us into lines so we can be patted down for shanks, drugs, cell phones, or other contraband. A Puerto Rican guy named Vic from New York, who I have become friends with, is caught wrapping a menacing-looking knife into clothes on his way to hide it in the washing machine. Vic has a lot of influence in here. Two guards cuff him up. The look on his face is worse than a wild bull at a, radio, at a rodeo. As Vic walks past me in cuffs, he comments, that dumbass white boy just fucked up my close-to-home transfer. I know that he is talking about Spivey. It won't be long before everyone knows he is the culprit. Once we are all searched, we are led outside. Staff rips every cell apart. Garbage bags filled with wine are carted out of the unit, paraded for all to see. Cells where weapons are found get locked while the people housed in them are located, cuffed, and escorted to the chute. This was an unexpected shakedown. No one was prepared. Men are upset that they lost knives and contraband. Blood is the only way to pay for the wrongs, as if blood fixes the problem. Spivey looks like a deer caught in headlights when he hears a D.C. prisoner call out, Who the stupid motherfucker pulled the fire alarm? For a long moment, no one responds. I stare at Spivey, wondering what he's going to do. After another long moment, we hear his voice. I did this shit on accident. What? 
Accident? Spivey's eyes widen as he swallows. It was an accident, bro. Accident? You got everyone fucked up, Slim. I said my bad, bro. The shit was not intentional. Before long, the DC prisoners are talking with the Crips. The shot caller for Spivey's gang lives in our unit. After the DC prisoners are done talking to the Crips leader, Spivey's gets, Spivey gets summoned over to their area. Every car is responsible for their own people. Each car is given an opportunity to discipline those who violate convict rules. Through his own ignorance, Spivey has violated prison rules. To prevent things from escalating, his own people have to deal with him. Small things can go from zero to 100 in a matter of seconds. White prisoners and black gangs are easy marks when they transgress or break rules. In most cases, black gang members don't really want a white person in their gang. So when he does violate prison conduct, hurting him comes easy. The cries for Spivey's blood ensure his imminent assault. Prison politics have dictated Spivey's fate. The sole atonement for his transgressions is the shedding of his blood, as if we are stuck in Old Testament times. All eyes are on Spivey. He knows what's in store. Despite the fact that violence is waiting to greet him, he is courageous. He does not take the walk of shame. Not checking in could cost him his life. He chooses to gamble. Most of the white prisoners consider Spivey a race, a race traitor. This fuels their hatred of him. Some blacks dislike him because they believe he is out of place. Championing the attack on him was easy. Before long, Spivey is in a cell with one of his Crip brothers to be disciplined. Banging and slamming can be heard coming from the cell. It takes no more than five minutes. The two combatants emerge from the cell. Spivey has a swollen eye, but the man sent in to met out discipline looks worse. Blood trickles from his lip. The shot callers for DC and New York are not pleased. None of Spivey's blood has been shed. This prompts the Crip shot caller to call for a second round. The second time will likely be worse. And it is. Two Crip gang members go into the cell, Spivey in tow. One man stands in front of the cell door blocking any escape. The banging begins again. As I predicted, round two was less favorable to Spivey. The door is being slammed into. It's probably Spivey attempting to escape. The man, holding the, the man holding the door looks in. Once he is satisfied by what he sees, he moves away, allowing Spivey to exit. Spivey comes out swinging, his fist, while his two attackers pursue him into the day room, one with a shiny piece of metal, the other with a padlock tied to a belt. Spivey retreats, his face a bloody mess. Stab wounds to his neck and back. He stumbles to the guard's office in search of a reprieve. He yells for a nurse. The cop panics. Fumbling for his radio, he knocks it to the ground. The guard throws himself at the radio, grabs it with both hands, and hits the deuces. Once again, staff members fill the unit. They order everyone to lock in. Surprisingly, everyone complies without protest. They know in the eyes of the decision makers, this is a minor incident. This lock-in won't last long. Blood still dripping off him, Spivey addresses the unit. He's shouting. Y'all a bunch of drama king-ass bitches crying like suckers. He walks out of the unit with his head down, a man wounded both physically and emotionally. What a brutal assault like this does to a men's mentality is, interesting, is an interesting study. These attacks have turned many men paranoid. I have not faced a brutal assault, but witnessing these assaults makes me wonder when someone is going to decide that I have done something wrong and deserve to be attacked. After all, this is Big Sandy. It has to happen at some point. With the blood cleaned up, within an hour the cells are unlocked for us all to mingle. Tonight is American Idol night, something many prisoners enjoy. Even the tough guys bring their chairs and sit and watch the show. Like the rest, I park my chair in front of the television two times a week to tune in. The show is another small escape to a different place. Happiness, excitement, sadness. The program has all of these. Sometimes I slip off into a daydream. In those dreams, I am at the show, singing along, clapping with the free people to the beat of the song. In reality, though, I am still in my hard plastic chair, my feet planted to the hard, concrete floor, and the music is only zipping through my headphones. I look around. I want to see my reality. Most of us are dead men walking. Life seems to have no meaning when you know the rest of it will be spent filled with violence, concrete, and blood. Once you give up, nothing matters. When your life is gone, there's nothing anyone can do to hurt you. 
I say a silent prayer. I pray that I never tread those waters where I throw the towel in, where I quit on life. For now, my mind focuses on tasting freedom again. It's the only thing that keeps me walking forward each day. Like Nelson Mandela, I am on my own long walk to freedom. There are only a few days of peace before the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas strikes at Dinky. A prisoner named Snow has been prospecting for the gang under Dinky's tutelage. The only problem is, Snow has a drinking problem. In his last drunken stupor, he was disrespecting other white prisoners, saying stupid stuff. Because he was prospecting for the gang, instead of being beat up, he was put on drinking restriction. Instead of following orders, he jumped right back inside the bottle and let that lead him down the road to verbally assaulting some more black prisoners. Those tra transgressions have stamped his ticket. The blacks take their complaints to Dinky, who promises them blood for the disrespect. Snow has been a good prospect for the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. Before anyone can join the gang, they must show their commitment to the group. They have to prove their loyalty. Proving oneself worthy is a matter of how much violence or work someone puts in to further the gang's objectives. When Snow arrived, he was housed in Dinky's unit. That allowed Dinky to sink his claws into him. Prison is filled with manipulators. Manipulating Snow was easy. Dinky used him as a missile to wreak havoc on others. The circle has now come back to devour him. Two men, Harley and another prospect, Russ, are dispatched to avenge the blacks being disrespected. Snow was found unconscious, beaten to a pulp. He is carted out of the unit on a stretcher, his head a massive, swollen mess. He has a one-way ticket off this lonely mountain of pain. He is leaving the same way he came in, with a big bang. Both Harley and Russ are led off to the shoe for their two-week stay. Russ is now on a roll in his pursuit of, of obtaining a patch. He consistently racks up one violent act after another in the name of the gang he has pledged an allegiance to, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. When a prospect completes his probation period for the gang, if he is found deserving, a tattoo representing the gang is inked into his skin, indicating he is an official, real-life gang brother of this crew of misfits. Violence has been on a fast-forward kind of trajectory this week. A guard has revealed to Dinky that a new prisoner from Texas is in for child pornography. There is a sick sense of excitement. Men salivate when these types of offenders take their chance on USP Big Sandy's battlefield. No mercy will be shown this unsuspecting victim. He has been convicted of committing the worst kind of crime. Victimizing an innocent child is reprehensible. I am perplexed as to why this man would try his luck. Some of these men have never been in trouble before, so they do not know what checking in is or how to do it. And I think some just want to die at someone else's hand. They lack the courage to take their own life. Prison staff tend to dislike child molesters as much as the felons here on campus do. Staff members know what is in store for those men if they send them out on the compound. Staff will send them out with a pat on the back and a silent, good luck. This is what happened with infamous Irish mob boss James Whitey Bulger in another federal prison. Staff sent him to the compound, casting him into a death pit where he did not last 24 hours. The newspaper article is circling. Child pornographer sentenced in Dallas court. One of the cops printed it off the internet. Dinky chooses one ABT gang member, a prospect, and an independent from Texas for this mission. The three assassins enter the housing unit the victims live in. Like Sonar, they lock their eyes on their intended target. Their icy glares freeze him. His instinct tells him they are here for him. The man moves fast, but he trips and stumbles to the ground. Somehow, he makes it back to his feet. Sneakers are squeaking against the freshly waxed floor. The chase begins. Almost as if on cue, a guard exits the office and notices the three, and notices the three pursuers giving chase. He hits the deuces. They close in on the sex offender. He is caught. They tackle him to the ground. His eyes indicate a reckless sense of fear for a split second. Then he's stabbed. He looks like a zebra taken down by three ruthless lions bent on dismembering him. A shrieking squeal like that of a stuck pig escapes from his lungs. Squirming under his attackers, he swings wildly, fighting for his life. Punches and kicks to his head. Another knife appears. For some reason, stab wounds are called hits or shots in here. He's hit in the shoulder blade. Another shot punctures his cheek. There is a mad scramble. Somehow, he is back on his feet. His heart is pounding. You can see it. He takes off running again. Blood mixes with sweat and tears falling from his eyes. He runs around a table and up the stairs. 
A swooshing sound fills the day room as, his, as staff rush in. The victim runs down the stairs. He's still being chased as he runs into the arms of a guard. Staff rustle the attackers to the ground. I see the depleted man through the officer's station window. He is on his knees crying into his hands, relieved that he still has his life. I think of the children he attacked. I mouth the words piece of shit to myself as I lock my cell door before the cops do. When I turn around, Mr. Young is nodding his head. What do you think of that one there, he asks. I don't know, I guess he's a dirtball, I answer. You know, Chad, he deserved what he got. You know, I don't like violence, but on a child molester, he got what his hand called for. I read the article. He was a real trash can, that guy. Too bad they didn't kill him, Mr. Young, I say harshly. Mr. Young raises his eyebrows. Nah, son, he deserves to be brutalized from prison to prison. Death is too easy for that son of a bitch. You know, they only give him 20 years for what he done. Yeah, I guess you're right. Death would be his way out. 20 years of prison misery might serve him right. The case manager let me read some of his PSI. He was raping his own six-year-old daughter, recording it and sending it to other people. Real sick puppy there, Chad. He got less time than me, I say with anger in my voice. Oh, they don't get him chomos what they deserve. If you sell drugs, they give you 40 years. If you rape kids, you get half of that. Boy, this government sure is stupid. I nod in agreement. Why the hell would they send him here, I asked Mr. Young. Oh, they was hoping someone killed that son of a bitch, Mr. Young says, his face turning red with anger. Lately, Mr. Young has been getting angrier at everything. His newfound anger brings increased cursing. Well, at least we won't be locked down too long, I say. We should be out soon. No one likes them damn chomos. They was hoping someone killed him, trust me. This is why the cop printed that article. Hell, the case manager showed me his PSI on that computer back there. Told me old buddy was a piece of filth. She has kids herself. I don't understand how he thought he was all right to just sit around watching the television or even coming out here on the yard. Some of them stupider than hell, Chad. They give it a try. Got their family making fake paperwork for them, saying they're in for selling meth or something. What they don't think about is the staff here will tell their business. They do so much bullshit around here, they don't want no one telling on them. So they don't like snitches or child molesters. You're right, Mr. Young. When it comes to kids, kids are innocent victims. Predators like that dude strip them of their innocence, their childhood. That scumbag raped his own kid because she was young, vulnerable, and weak. Kids look to their parents to protect them. This cat was destroying his own kid. I think they should have killed him. Now that's where we defer, Chad. Let him do about 15 miserable years, then kill him. We both laugh at Mr. Young's suggestion. We heard the hard metal sound of the doors being unlocked. I jumped down from the bunk knowing that the child molester was lucky to make it out of here today, wounded rather than killed. When one of those men try their hand in a place like this, they will get their due because everyone, staff and convicts, is working to make sure that goal is achieved. Chapter 26 Within 20 minutes of being out of our cells, we are ordered to lock in. People are asking the guard the reason for the lockdown. They are told the warden himself made the order because of the three separate issues of violence in one week. Locking us down is a way to punish the entire prison population. Stopping the violence is virtually impossible. The warden's hope is that caging people up will calm them down. They'll appreciate being out of the cell. This thought process is just wrong. To prisoners here at Big Sandy, being locked in, losing privileges, this is all part of doing business. In a shot caller's mind, if a situation calls for violence, damn with the consequences. With no real incentive to behave or to engage in rehabilitation, the violence will happen, and happen often. It never takes long for depression to set in. When I am alone with my thoughts, I often think of home, my family, my mother, my life before everything came crashing down. How long ago that was. These days now seem impossibly distant, the faintest recollections of a past life, a life that I no longer know. Thinking of that life, comparing it to this one, a feeling of sorrow wells up in my inner soul. What my life has become troubles me. I feel disgusted with myself for the choices I made. Like most men ha housed on this mountain, I fear that I might never leave this place. Each day is a mental struggle. The loneliness makes me tremble. Blowing up like the World Trade Center, my theme song. 
By smoking crack, Booper rescinded his position in our enterprise and went from bagging up 62s to big 8s to bigger things. Counting double-digit thousand stacks made me happy. I was changing the trajectory of my life. The fast life was being kind to me. Women, clothes, jewelry, cars. Being poor, struggling, those days were long gone. I had put them far behind me. What I never saw was that this sinister dungeon was my future. No one ever thinks about this part when the money is coming in, when life is good. At least I didn't. Big Sandy is part of being a drug dealer. It is an undesirable aspect, but it's all part of the package deal. Had I tasted even a little bit of this place, I would have made a career change. I would have gone from drug dealer to whatever else is behind window number two. This is it. This is what my life is now. Mr. Young is making coffee prison style. Like all things, this too is a process. A piece of fabric is cut from an old raggedy blanket. Mr. Young keeps just for lockdowns. It is about two feet long, eight inches wide. Once, he, once cut, he rolls the fabric up into what he calls a bun. After cutting a small strip of aluminum off an oatmeal pack, he connects each end to a double A, triple A battery, creating a spark. He lights a small piece of toilet paper on fire. The toilet paper is his lighter. He uses it to light his bun on fire. Mr. Young places the bun on the side of our toilet. This allows air to shoot up the middle of it. A soda can is filled with water and a long string is tied to the pull tab so he can hold the can over the open flames. Smelling the burning can and the smoke gives me an instant headache. It does nothing to the old man. My small cough makes Mr. Young look over his shoulder at me with a sly look. Well, it ain't Starbucks, son, but it's all I got, he says, changing the sly look to a grin. With my eyes burning, I respond. Do you think toxins get in that water from the can being burned? Chad, do you think I care much about toxins being in my water? This whole place is toxic to all of us, he, res he responds succinctly before turning back to the flame. Any chance of trying to talk to Mr. Young into ceasing his coffee making during lockdowns is out the door. He has to have his cup of joe daily. Three days of lockdown is our punishment for the violence. Not many men care. 72 hours is nothing but a vacation for staff and cons. Victor is out of the shoe for his knife offense. Droopy took his place for $500 in cash. For the cash, Droopy told the lieutenant that the shank belonged to him. When Vic was caught with the weapon, he had his transfer paperwork pending for a prison close to New York. A wire tie-up would have halted the transfer, getting close to home facility visits with family. The $500 is, is a small price to pay to visit with his loved ones. Everything in this prison is open to manipulation, even getting caught red-handed with a knife. Staff only care that the documentation says that someone is held responsible for the killing instrument, instruments that are found. Droopy's payday only costs him 12 days in the shoe. Droopy's payday allows him to get high for free after his small vacation. Things have been relatively calm for a few weeks since the last lockdown. But in a rare instance of solidarity, many of the convicts are coming together over the quality of the food as of late. The portions have become smaller. Food is comfort in prison. It is the one thing that everyone is concerned about, myself included. No one likes to be hungry. When a prisoner is hungry, they become angry, agitated. With agitation comes problems. Just weeks ago, there was a self-serve hot bar always stocked with rice, beans, and soup. Some men, some men lived off rice and beans. That has vanished. The cold bar that once held salad, vegetables, and other small things to eat has also disappeared. According to the food administrator, the food budget was over $100,000 in the red. Slashing the extras was his way of fixing the problem. Most men in here have little to no money. With the food cuts, it means they will be going to bed hungry. What that means for the prison is anyone's guess. I suspect more empty stomachs will lead to an increase in robberies, which will in turn increase the violence. I go to sleep thinking of the repercussions that will come as a result of the declining food situation. Keeping my eye on my belongings is a top priority. Today I wake up to what will be one of the worst days I will ever see in prison. I do not realize it until months later, but it is the start to my end on this mountain. Although they do not reside in this unit, they are here. Adam with Dennis and Ronnie behind them. Immediately I'm contemplating whether I violated any prison rules. I search my mind wondering if I told anyone how much I dislike Steve. I come up empty, but I still have a nervous feeling in my stomach. It's abnormal for all three of them to be in this unit. My eyes search for Frank. In my haste, I do not notice him just a few feet away. Like myself, he is watching them. Their eyes lock on us. 
They approach. My mouth is parched. Senses heightened as nervousness overcomes me. When they get closer, Adam sticks his hand out. What's up, homeboy? Why you look so paranoid, he asks. Given everything I have observed since coming here, I become leery if anything is out of tune, even a slight bit. Suspicious of people's real motives. I play things cool and shake Adam's hand. What the hell are you talking about? Paranoid? I ain't paranoid. I laugh it off to mask the truth he saw on my mug. What's up, though? You three aren't here for no reason. Yeah, you're right. We need you and Frank to move to our unit, bro. Why, I ask, curious. Some dudes got locked up in our unit. We don't want to lose any white cells with all these Mexicans coming here. We got empty cells we have to fill. Noticing my reluctance, Ronnie interjects. Look, Adam is your homeboy. You can go in a cell with him. Frank can go in a cell with me. As soon as we can work it out, you and Frank can get a cell together. Ronnie's explanation does not add up, prompting me to respond. I thought you said there were open cells now. There were, but we put some dudes in them for now to hold them down. But if you guys don't move, they're going to make the white dudes with no cellmates move in together. And then we're going to lose white cells, Ronnie retorts. He sounds demanding, sarcasm floating on his tongue. Sarcasm floating off his tongue. He is angry that I would even challenge him, as if we are little kids, obliged to do what they say without objection. My mind is made up. I don't like Ronnie either. In reality, me and Frank are being used so that Adam and Ronnie can keep their cells. They want us to save them from having to move in with each other. I don't want to move. To me, living with the top dogs in the car is a recipe for disaster. The more people together from the car, the more potential for issues. Frank and I are as comfortable as you can be while in prison in our own unit. Mr. Young is in my peripheral vision shaking his head, as if he's willing me to say no. Really though, refusing really isn't an option. If we refuse, it will cause animosity. Against my better judgment, I lamely agree to move in their housing unit. Saying no would have caused our ranking in the hierarchy of the car to tumble. Precipitously. The next time that car needed work put in, Frank and I would have been called on to be the missiles. My position in the car is maintained simply because I am from New York. The Irish descent helps as well. The two things, I, the two things can only carry me so far. Those two things can only carry me so far. How far is up for debate? Frank's initial dislike for Steve is slowly fading. Steve's stories have begun to mesmerize him. He's falling into the snake's grasp. He is beginning to dance to Steve's every tune, a hypnotized cobra before an Indonesian man playing his instrument. The sad, empty feeling has come again. Moving always messes up my nerves. Not knowing what lies ahead does it to the best of men. Leaving Mr. Young bothers me as well. My head down, I go to my cell to pack my belongings. Making the best out of a bad situation is the only option I really have. I look up to see Mr. Young staring intently at me. What did they want? They want us to move downstairs so they don't lose white cells or some shit. I ain't moving downstairs with them son of a... I put up my hand to stop Mr. Young. Not you, me and Frank. Did I not tell you not to get involved with those clowns from the start? But you chose not to listen to the old man, right? Come on with this shit. Now was not the time, I answer angrily. Why don't you just tell him you was comfortable here? That you wasn't moving, boy? It don't work that way, Mr. Young. You know it don't. Bullshit. You got 40 years. Stand up to them son of a bitches. Mr. Young points his finger at me. His voice rises. Then what? They punched my head off? If you would have listened to me from Jump Street, you wouldn't be in this position now. Now, would you? I get angry in an instant. I stand up. I point my finger back at Mr. Young. You're an old man. Things work differently for younger guys in here. I am an asset to them dudes. I'm from New York. No way were they going to let me stay here and be on my own. If I refused the car, they might not have stabbed me, but they would have beat the shit out of me. Because you're old with mo no money, no one fucks with you. My problems are bigger than yours. He is shaking as he responds. He is like a father scolding an unruly child. Get your shit and get the hell out of here. Remember this, young man, I told you so. Don't forget that I told you so. Mr. Young leaves our cell with the slam of the door. Well... His cell now. Fucking prison. This is prison. This is where these dirty motherfuckers sent me for 40 years. In my heart, I know I just don't have 40 years in me. I know I don't. I just cannot do 40 years in here. Reluctantly, I move my things into Adam's cell. It looks like a cyclone has been through here. The comfortable feeling of living in a clean cell with the old man. 
I'm probably not going to have that again. Once again, Big Sandy teaches me small things matter. This new cell looks like a junkyard. Within minutes, I miss the shiny wax floors that Mr. Young was so meticulous about. The sparkling clean toilet and sink and the small knickknacks. My new home is adorned with scuff marks on the wall because Adam's cell is a makeshift wrestling ring for the guys in the car. Prison issued black boots are what caused the black scars on the off-white paint. Books are in disarray. Clothing strewn throughout the cell. Dried toothpaste on the mirror. Hair in the sink from Adam's excessive brushing of his long black hair. The living quarters looks more like a teenager's room in his parents' basement than a maximum security federal prison cell. With an uneasy feeling in my new house, I commit to myself to keep my bed made and my property neatly tucked away in my assigned locker until I can escape this situation. Everything in prison has a price, even cells. A guy who lives alone finding himself in debt or desperate to get high will sell his cell for a price. If he finds another guy living alone that he can move in with, he will sell his cell and split the profit with the other guy. Sales go from $200 to $500. Real estate shopping is now a priority. In fact, looking around this cell once again, it's my first priority. But finding a cell to buy is not an easy task. You have to catch the right person at the right time. Both Frank and I make our rounds in the unit. We greet all the homeboys with fake smiles. At least I do. Frank is falling for Steve's manipulation little by little. Me, I'm going through the motions. I feel dead without being dead. Given my dislike for Steve, moving into this unit is like flirting with death. At least 20 guys in the car live in this unit. Most occupy cells upstairs in the back corner of the unit. If Steve called on them to attack, they would rip me apart like a pack of wolves. I'm going to have to be very careful with what I say. Very careful with what I do. To say I feel trapped makes a mockery of, of an understatement. I am in prison inside a prison. There are some other white prisoners living in the unit with us. To my surprise, they are gang members. Imagine that, living under the same roof in close proximity to their number one hater. I know two of these men. Joe is a SAC gang member. SAC stands for Soldiers of Aryan Culture. His cellmate is a young man named TJ, who was once a hammer skin. Today, he is prospecting to be part of the Aryan Brotherhood, or brand. TJ does not know it now, but he is marching toward a Solomon fate, already sealed. He came to prison with what comics would call a short sentence. He will never be a free man again. He will never leave prison. He will move up the ladder for his gang by killing another convict. And with this deliberate act, seal his own destiny. These gang members coexist with us inside this concrete jungle we inhabit for as long as Steve remains sensible. If he drops the hammer or calls the shot, we would decimate our rivals. If the gang members ever had the hand that Steve has now, there would be no hesitation on their part. They would attack us. I'm perplexed. Why doesn't Steve make his move? Perplexed, perplexed, but relieved as well. I really want to make it out of this place alive, if that is possible. The air crackles with tension between us and them. The only problem is, there are many more of us than them. They know they would be on the losing end if they made the wrong move. Nobody has to say this out loud, but I know that if the numbers change, things will get ugly quickly. They hate Steve as much as he hates them. Dennis lives in the back cell, three cells from our cell. Like Red, Dennis runs his own tattoo shop making good prison money. Similarly, he also has a penchant for heroin, which sucks up his profits leaving his locker bare. No food, no necessities. Heroin in his veins like a fish in the sea. It chases away his misery. The loneliness that hits all men on this side of the razor wire, like a cannon, direct and broadsided. The picture is slowly being formed. I see Steve, Adam, Dennis, and Ronnie for what they are. Men who have formed a car that benefits them. This is the wheel of prison turning, devouring, depleting the men in the car for whatever resources they have to offer. Steve is like an amusement ride conductor at the helm, cracking the lever of evil. After two weeks in this unit, I can see things ever more clearly. To my satisfaction, the prison real estate market has not been kind to me. New white gang members have arrived on the bus. Our unit has been gifted two tattooed Aryan Brotherhood of Texas gang members. Steve, always the weird, paranoid man, is not happy about the new arrivals. Not happy they live amongst us. His propaganda machine is running full throttle. He fills the soldiers' heads with fear, warning all of us, daily, to keep our eyes and ears open. Steve instructs us to keep our knives on us at all times. 
living in this unit has spiked my stress levels on account of the fear of what might happen to me or what might have or what I might have to do to sustain my own life. Judges, prosecutors, Congress, no one knows what is really what is really going on here. If they did, maybe someone would shut this place down, start over, culture change. All manner of problems and death and violence find people in here. People who aren't looking for any of it. One of the three are always knocking at my door, no matter how much I want to avoid them. I am afraid to answer the door, but the way time works, I know it is inevitable. This is for a for sure thing. That peaceful cell with Mr. Young is long gone and dearly missed. Am I dreaming? Boom, boom, boom. Banging, echoing in my mind. It reverberates off the metal bed frame. There it is again. Boom, boom, boom. My sleep is interrupted. <clears throat> the loud banging is at my door. Wiping my eyes, I focus on my watch. It is 4.30 p.m. Both of us fell asleep during the 4 o'clock p.m. count. I look to the cell door's window to see a face staring into our darkened room. Adam, I need you to turn the light on for me, comes the voice at the door. What? What's the problem now? Adam hollers back while still laying in his bunk. I need the light on. I need to talk to you. Adam, it's the lieutenant. I say after making out his white shirt and the metal bars on his collar. Are you fucking kidding me? Adam yells at the door. Groggy, he stands up, makes his way to the light, and flicks on the switch. What? He shouts, spreading his arms out. What the fuck do you want? Trying to be polite, the lieutenant says, We need you and your cellmate to cuff up for us. What the fuck for, jerk off? Adam yells back. Adam explodes like the 4th of July. Looking at me, at me he says, There's a bunch of asshole cops out here. Adam, the warden wants us to lock you, Steve, Dennis, and Ronnie up for a few days. This ain't my call. I'm just doing my job. Steve yells out through the crack in his door. Adam, fuck them. We're going hard. Get the team. Go get your goon squad. Steve has given the sacred order to fight back against the staff, setting Adam off like a madman out of control. Adam unleashes a barrage of threats, promises, and curses at the cops, standing on the other side of the door. Looking at me, he raises his eyebrows. Chad, you ready to go hard? Man, it's whatever, I respond. Not because it's how I really feel, but it's the only answer. The last thing I want to do is engage in a physical altercation with the guards. It is the lesser of the two evils, though. The cops won't stab me. The car will. Again, I'm damned if I do, and damned if I don't. Chad, if they come in here, I'm stabbing them. This is not what I signed up for. My fake confidence wavers. Now I'm hoping that somehow, someone can talk these guys down before things get any further out of control. Someone has to fold their hand. If Steve refuses, me and Adam are getting gassed with a super soaker filled with mace. The captain is at, the captain is at Steve's door explaining that this is over different cars taking ownership of cells. He says the warden is only locking them up for a few days along with some other shot callers from various groups. The warden wants to talk to the prison bosses of the other cars. Other prisoners are riled, riled up now, kicking their cell doors, egging on the disturbance. No one can get a word in, causing staff to fold. In frustration, they leave the unit. Once they're gone, the noise diminishes. Steve calls to Adam. Listen, I think we should go ahead, go over there so we don't lose the cells. If they team us, they won't let us out of the hole. The captain said a couple of days before the warden talks to us, so whatever you want to do, you make the call. Me and Chad are ready for whatever, Adam yells back. All right, this is what we will do. Leave our cellies here to hold the cells down. If that is the agreement, we leave peacefully. If not, we go full throttle. To my relief, it looks like this thing is going to end peacefully. I hope. Adam looks at me with a serious face and instructs me to get all the guys together as soon as the doors are unlocked and let them know to be on point. He also tells me that we have to stay strapped with weapons. Adam speculates that the gang members might make a move on us now, that the top guys will be in the shoe. The homemade blind goes up on our window so no one can see into our cave. Adam shows me a fake shelf he has in his locker. I knew it was there, just never took a look for myself. He pries open the shelf, exposing a six-inch six gap that reveals his secret stash. Inside, seven bone crushers are tucked away from prying eyes. Listen, Chad, don't show no one this spot or tell anyone about it. Make sure all the brothers have a weapon. Do not sleep on these gang dudes. If they get out of line, kill them, because they will kill you, bro. All right, man, I got you. I will make sure everyone is armed, I say, nodding in agreement. Nervousness makes my stomach quiver. Confused and scared, I realize that prison is about to get real. Moving to this unit placed me in a position where I'm already reaping the consequences I feared. 
consequences I never wanted to be manifested. These instruments of destruction have been in this cell since my arrival. I am amazed at the hiding spot. It's fashioned from a shelf ripped out of another locker that fits perfectly over the top of Adam's bottom shelf. Two other guys in the unit know about the hiding spot, Chad. Don't trip. Both are trustworthy. I take the trustworthy comment with a grain of salt. From my own experience, no one is trustworthy in prison. Being in this cell with this cachet of weapons bothers me. The last thing I want to do is be caught with this steel. I try to avoid problems. My appeal is still pending. Instead, I'm tossed into a fire. I pray I don't get burned. The blind comes off the window and the cops return with Miss L, the associate warden. She is attractive for an older woman. She knows how to deal with violent, angry men. Miss L has a reputation for being respectful as well as honest. She promises Steve that if he comes out peacefully, no one will be in the shoe longer than a week. After some jockeying <clears throat> and compromising in a lame effort to save face, Steve sticks his skinny arms through the slot and cuffs up. He is the first to be let out. After the king exits, his political cabinet follows. Adam, Dennis, and Ronnie are all taken to the chute. The car is left with no leadership. Once the doors are unlocked, we are summoned into Steve's room by his cellmate, Jimmy. Steve has left him a game plan for the car. We are all told to stay in groups of three, everyone armed with a weapon. Also, no one can get drunk or high while our leaders are away. The men seem jittery, creating their own tension. I try to stay calm. Staying calm allows me to think clearly. It allows me to be aware of those around me. The younger white guys in the car want to provoke an issue with the white gang members. They believe conquering them would make Steve proud. I voice my opinion. Thinking rationally without provoking a physical altercation is in all of our best interest, I tell the misfits. Our main goal is to make sure all four men make it out of the hole. If we provoke an issue, this will not happen, and it will piss Steve off. The misguided agree. Everyone is now armed with a steel pipe or knife. We still have the numbers in our favor. There are some heavy hitters among our ranks. It would be a mistake for the gang members to move on us. The lions reign supreme. They are hyenas. They despise this reality, but they do not allow ignorance to overcome their intelligence. While gang members in federal prison are used, are used to asserting their power over every other white prisoner in these confines, the independent movement has stifled their control. I had a false misconception about white gang members before entering these doors. I thought they were about their race, about uplifting their own, living righteously. I was wrong. They pilfer, extort, and rob their own for the most part, simply to get high. Steve is doing the same thing, just not as extreme. He says he stands against the gang members, yet he commits oppression through manipulation. Fear-mongering is his preferred tool. That's what he uses to achieve his goals. My first order of personal business is to clean the cell. Adam's absence allows me to remove the scuff marks. Walls, floors, and the mirror are cleaned. The toilet sparkles like Mr. Young's. When the cell locks, I can lay back comfortable. Sucking in the alone time relieves some pressure. I am in my solitude. Finding some moments of contaminated peace. I slide a bone crusher under my pillow. My first night alone in Big Sandy makes me giddy in an absurd way. I didn't know those chapters were going to take that long, so I hope you guys enjoyed them. You know, prison is, like I said, a machine that will chew you up, spit you out. It's a place where I continuously tell you that you do not want to be. But why do you not want to be there? Look at the life. Look at the tension. Look up the made-up reasons to assault people, to commit violence, to fight the cops. Adam was a serious dude, man. Balls to the wall, didn't give a shit. Because there came a point in his life where I feel he gave up. He gave up on life. So nothing mattered. It didn't matter if he went hard and stabbed the cop. He wanted me to go along with him. And then what? What if I would have won my appeal? There's plenty of people sitting in federal prison that had only a little bit of time that killed someone in prison and now they're never getting out. And Tommy Silverstein, we talked about Tommy, terrible Tom. He ended up winning his appeal, but he had already killed other people. So again, he never got out of prison. I didn't want to be that dude, man. You don't want to be that dude. You don't want to be that chick. I don't know how hard the you know female prisons go, but you don't want to be there. Damn. You don't want to be locked in a cell with a bunch of knives in there and the cops, and you only got seven years or eight years, and they search it, and now guess what? You got a new case. They're starting to give out new cases now. They're tired of the bullshit. So they're giving out new cases, man. And then we talked about the chomo in there. Like, I used to be mind-boggled. Like, how and why would these dudes even try their luck? You know, like the cop that came on the compound. 
Like these dudes go out on the compound and they try their luck, man. Just, you know, Jomos are not going to make it in Big Sandy. I can promise you that. And, you know, there might be some staff members watching this. Because I heard, and I might interview this kid that I was in Big Sandy with, Doug. You know, I heard that the cops were reading my book, watching the channel. And they know. The cops know. They will put you out there, man. If you're a sex offender, if you did some bullshit, they'll print your case off the Internet. You know, guys got cell phones and stuff now, so they'll, they'll check it themselves. But the cops will show people your PSI. They'll print your paperwork. They do all kinds of crazy shit. Definitely not a place for uh, a sex offender to be. Definitely not USP Big Sandy. Definitely not any maximum security prison. Dinky. You know, someone wrote me about Dinky the other day. And I don't know if she's going to watch this video all the way through. But if she does, I'm going to say this. You know, I've seen pictures of Dinky like he was in, the, in like this Christian thing, I think, while he was in prison. I found out how he died. You know, they say that he was found hanging in his cell. But, you know, if the man changed his life, man, then all power to him. I pray that he changed his life. I pray that he's in a better place, man. You know, I don't, I hated him for a long time. You know, I had a lot of hate in my heart, man, towards these people because of the things that were done to people. And I felt like things were being done to dudes for no reason. Like there were excuses, things were made up. You know, they called some, you know, good shots, but called a whole lot of bad ones, man. And when you start calling bad shots, man, you start stabbing good dudes. You start trying to steal people's shit because you want to get high. Well, in my eyes, those are bad dudes, man. And some people can say, well, prison's a, you know, a dog eat dog world. Yeah, but there has to be some sort of respect. And that's the problem, that we turn prison into a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and that's why we're treated the way that we're treated. That's why they're only allowed to buy $50 in commissary a week right now. That's why the food is horrible. Because we don't come together for nothing, man. We come together when we want to fight each other. And I'm not promoting fighting the police or fighting the system, but I am prom promoting stand up for something, man, or you'll fall for anything. You don't have to be violent to accomplish what you want to accomplish. You want better food. You want better living conditions. You know, you, you heard about the top five riots in Attica. Them dudes died, man, so that we could have some, you know, some things. In all prisons, state prisons, federal prisons. They died for a reason, man. And yet, you know, all these years later, man, what is it, 40, 50 years later, we disrespect them by doing the shit that we do. So... It's about coming together, man. It's about coming together for a common good. It's about not running around stabbing other men, man. Killing other people. Somebody's got a mother. And the warden's going to call that person's mother and say, hey, your son's dead. Come on, man. You get enjoyment out of that. You heard from the dude the other night about Ricky Fackrell. And I can tell you, after we did the interview, he got teary-eyed, man. He was shooting him a kite. They became good friends in prison. And then, you know, guys go home and you forget about people. You still remember them, but you forget about them in the sense where you're not really doing anything for the people. You know, maybe your life is rough. Maybe you don't have much money. Maybe you're taking care of your family. You can't send a couple bucks. And then, you know what, it starts to get old. You've been home a year, two years. You don't send Christmas cards, nothing. Maybe you're watching this show and you left a good friend behind, man. This year, send them an Easter card, man. Send them a St. Patrick's Day card. Send them a Christmas card. I hope you enjoyed the book, man. But it's real, man, and, and I do re relive some of that shit when I'm reading it, man. Oh, the funny parts. You know, I remember laughing when we were in Red Cell when uh, Sad Boy was making fun of Steve. It was a fun time in prison, if there is a fun time in such a con contaminated place. There's times where, you know, I, I, I feel it, man, and there's dudes that are watching this show. I got a brother out of Ohio. I said, man, I, I feel it, man, like I'm right back there. Sometimes when I'm talking about that cell and, I'm laying there talking about my family and my life, man, I'm there again. And I'm experiencing it all over. It don't hurt as bad, but you still feel the pain. You don't want to feel that pain, man. I don't care what physical pain you've endured, the pain of not being with your son, the pain of not being with your mother on Christmas, the pain of not taking your daughter to that daughter-father dance. Those are the things that hurt, man. This ain't scared straight. This is real and it's raw. It's, this is how it really is. This is what it's like to go to bed hungry at night. Do you want to go to bed hungry at night? Do you want to miss your daughter? Do you want to miss a Christmas? Yeah, you're out here getting money now. You can buy all kinds of Christmas presents. But those Christmas presents that you're buying for the next two, three years, they can't compare 
to the 20 Christmases where you can't even buy them a candy cane or even send them a Christmas card. Blood on the razor wire TV, man. With respect, until tomorrow, we're out.